Hey, good morning, folks. It's, it's, uh, it's my pleasure today to welcome Peter Clark, who is currently a senior uh, research manager at uh, the Allen Institute for AI, or commonly known as AI2. Um, Peter got his PhD at Strathclyde, where he did some work in machine learning in a, a fairly popular rule induction system called CM2 with Don McKay, who was at the time at the Turing Institute, um, as well as an advisor. Uh, he since then has been spent time at the University of Ottawa and University of Texas, and for the last 20 or so years has been in the Seattle area, first at, at Boeing, then at Vulcan, and most recently at, at AI2. And during that time, uh, he spent a, much of his effort in what we call now machine reading comprehension, looking at how people can understand uh, written language, spoken language, and was involved in early, the early Acquaint efforts in, in this area, Boeing in collaboration, I think it was with ISI and USC, had some of the top performing systems in, in those early efforts. Um, about a decade ago, I guess, you started looking at understanding scientific literature and reasoning about science, which is an interesting mix of language plus common sense knowledge plus uh, sometimes the pragmatics of the, the particular application. Uh, he started doing some of that at uh, Boeing and, and Vulcan. And over the last five years has been, five or six years has been at AI2, where he's led the Aristo project that looks again at trying to uh, understand how people learn about and reason about and make sense of science. And he's done this using the New York Regents science exams as a benchmark uh, test. And over the last year, I'd say, made really significant progress in this when he incorporated some of the larger scale language models that have become really prevalent in the last couple of years to a much broader set of tools that are involved in, in the system. And so one of the things I think that characterizes Peter's work over the years is um, his work in machine learning, knowledge-based reasoning, and natural language understanding, and pulling them all together in systems like this that actually try to uh, to solve natural language and, and reasoning tasks. And so, uh, Peter, welcome. And I'm sure we'll hear a lot about the, the, the work in the, the science exams. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, as you know, we had uh, um, a success with our Aristo system during the summer where we got uh, over 90% on the eighth grade science exam. So what I want to do today is to tell you a bit about uh, what's inside Aristo and what it does, and um, partly on Susan's request to try and dig in a bit into the details about what's going on under the hood. Is it just doing glorified pattern matching, or is there something more significant going on? Um, where does it fail? What are the limitations of it? Um, so I'm going to try and dwell on that analysis for, for part of it. Just as, uh, just as background, so the whole Endeavor of Aristo came from Paul Allen. Uh, so he had a vision of uh, building intelligent machines, the, the, the grand AI vision. In his, in his book, The Idea Man, he writes, um, over the last decade, I began to think about a digital Aristotle, an easy to use, all encompassing knowledge storehouse to advance the field of AI. And so Aristo is kind of Aristotle as a boy. So that's where the name came from. And then um, to try to operationalize research on this idea, um, we chose to focus on science as an application domain and to look at uh, science exams as a way of measuring progress. Um, and when you see some of the questions on the science exams, uh, you'll see why this is particularly uh, challenging, because these questions are hard. Uh, here's an example. Uh, of a typical eighth grade science question. How are the particles in a block of iron affected when the block is melted? And the answer is the, the particles move more rapidly. And to, um, to answer this question, you need both science knowledge that temperature affects uh, particle movements. And then there's some subtle common sense that's needed as well. So you need to know that um, to melt something, you have to raise its temperature and then be able to connect those, those facts together. Um, just um, regarding science exams as a grand challenge for AI, um, our goals are um, we want a machine that can answer a wide variety of questions, answer complex questions, uh, questions that involve common sense and world knowledge. And so uh, science questions seem a great fit for that. 
Um, and then for a task to be, from a practical point of view, for a grand challenge to chase after, we need a task that's uh, clearly measurable, it's graduated, has degrees of success in achieving it, shouldn't be gameable, it's got to be ambitious and motivating. And when you look at the science exams and go through, you find that uh, pretty much all these uh, characteristics are checked. So uh, this has made pursuing science tests a, a, a good challenge for us to look at. It's by no means a sole test of uh, intelligence, of course. It's just one example of uh, a way of measuring a system's aptitude, but it certainly has a lot of the requirements that you'd uh, like to meet for, for a grand challenge. So here's a couple of example questions. So um, this is a simple question that we uh, get in the exam. So which object is the best conductor of electricity? And the answer, of course, is uh, an iron nail. And the, the reason this is relatively easy is because if you go on the web, there's actually many sentences that say nails conduct electricity. Um, a more challenging question would be this one. Um, city, this is one of my favorites. Uh, city administrators can encourage energy conservation by doing what? Uh, lowering parking fees, building larger parking lots, decreasing the cost of gasoline, or lowering the cost of bus and subway fares. So this is the right answer here. So this, to, to solve this, at least in a principal way, is very complicated. You need to know that uh, lowering bus fares is going to include, encourage public ridership, which is uh, good for energy conservation. So it's, uh, it's a tricky question. There are many questions like this in the science exams. Um, there are a couple of categories of questions that we've not covered in the last couple of years. So our work uh, this year and the previous year has been on uh, non-diagram multiple choice questions. Uh, so the last couple of years, uh, we've steered away from diagrams. And the reason for that is, um, as you can see here, there's a huge variety of different types of diagrams that appear, all with quite different semantics. And this is a very, very challenging uh, task to interpret these, and even just to do the basic uh, image processing. Um, and then, uh, at least for the, the work we've done this year, we, we've not focused on direct answer questions as well. Part of the reason for this is most of the direct answer questions in the Regents' exams uh, are about diagrams. So out of uh, 482 direct answer questions in the Regents' exams, only 38 don't involve diagrams, so it's a fairly small, uh, small fraction. Um, and then secondly, direct answer questions uh, in science are again extremely challenging. They involve synthesis and explanation, and these are again uh, areas for kind of further study. So for the point of view of this talk, I'm just going to talk about uh, the, the non-diagram multiple choice questions. Um, this is, so we've been working on this for like uh, six years. Uh, when we started, which was when AI2 formed, uh, back in 2014, we were getting a score of about 36% on the eighth grade exams. And then we added in some uh, baseline methods using statistics and information retrieval, a couple of rule-based systems to try and do some uh, simple uh, reasoning about questions, and that got our score up to about 63%. And then at that point, we... Um, released uh, a challenge to the community called the Allen AI Science Challenge. This was on the uh, Kaggle uh, uh, framework. Uh, so we released uh, several thousand eighth grade questions and challenged people to build a system that performed well on this. Uh, we had about uh, 3,000 downloads of the data set. There are about 750 uh, teams that uh, entered the competition um, but even after all that work, the, the winning system got just under 60% on this exam. Uh, and so that led to this article that appeared in business saying, the best AI still flunks eighth grade science, which was a re reflection on the challenges of trying to, trying to answer these questions. So this was the state just three years ago. Um, then we continued to add uh, some additional uh, reasoning methods. And then, of course, uh, the big change this year has been with the addition of new language model technology, where um, suddenly our score has jumped right up to uh, 90%. So uh, language models have had a huge impact and actually are responsible for most of the, the heavy lifting now within uh, Aristo. Um, and interestingly, at EMNLP two weeks ago, uh, 
Noam Slonin was talking about the IBM debater system, and he put up a uh, progress plot very similar to this, and he had a big leap at the end for the last year uh, for similar reasons. Um, and I think this graph really shows, reflects the progress of NLP as a whole, um, uh, in particular in the last year with these new language models. So um, this has been uh, pretty uh, su surprising to many people, in, uh, including us. Uh, we also tested the system on uh, the, the latest three eighth grade exams, uh, 2017 to 2019. Uh, the system got 93% on the non-diagram multiple choice sections. We've also run this on the fourth grade and twelfth grade exams and on our own big database of several thousand science exams, and we get similar performances. So this isn't just like a fluke score. This really reflects uh, progress that the field's made. Um, so what I want to do is just give you a very quick picture about how Aristo works, so what's going on inside and then talk about what's going on behind the high scores and uh, what's, uh, what the system's doing, what it's not doing, and whether it's uh, just doing clever tricks or doing something more. So here's a brief, brief summary of what's going on inside Aristo. So uh, th this is a massively simplified architecture, but it's, it's essentially an ensemble of eight different solvers that work together to try to solve uh, science questions. And there's three groups we have uh, retrieval and statistical systems, uh, some inference solvers, and then language models. So I'll just briefly talk about all three of these and just give you a very quick feel of what the, uh, what the algorithms are doing. So in terms of retrieval and statistics, um, there's an information retrieval solver. It basically goes to a large corpus, tries to find a sentence that best matches a question and an answer option. For the answer option and question that best matches a sentence, it'll pick that answer option. Um, the corpus we're using is a web crawl that came from the University of Waterloo. It's about a third of a terabyte of, of text, plus the science parts of Wikipedia, plus uh, several science textbooks that we've added into the corpus. Um, then we have a PMI solver, which simply tries to look at uh, correlations between question words and answer words. Uh, using the PMI measures, and we look at uh, uh, unigrams, bigrams, skipgrams, and so on, and to try to pick the answer option that seems most correlated with the, uh, the words in the question. Uh, and then we have another system called ACME, which is sort of like PMI, except instead of linking question words with answer words, it tries to do this via science terms in a term bank. So we have a term bank of about 5,000 uh, science terms, and the system uses vector spaces to uh, try to work out whether a question and answer relate to a common term within this, uh, this term bank. And so the insight here is that uh, um, if you want to assess the lexical cohesion between a question and an answer, you can do this better by pivoting through a space of uh, uh, science terminology. And so all these methods are really good for simple questions like this one. Uh, infections may be caused by mutations and microorganisms. Here is the right answer. And a question like this is well supported. There are many sentences in our uh, corpus which say things like products contaminated with microorganisms may cause infection, which provide both uh, IR evidence and statistical evidence for this kind of question. So those are kind of the retrieval statistical systems. Uh, then we have a set of inference solvers. Um, again, just to briefly summarize those, the first one is um, called tuple inference. And so this tries to reason with uh, a set of uh, tuples extracted from natural language. So we take sentences, uh, extract the subject, verb, object structures, sometimes with additional arguments, and then align these with the, with the, uh, the question. And so the, um, the insight here is that tuples strip away some of the irrelevance uh, information contained in sentences and more uh, clearly crystallize some of the core contents. And um, we can also use these to try to do some sort of chaining and reasoning. So just to illustrate how this works, here's, a, here's another question. Um, stormy weather negatively affects the coastline by causing erosion. So given a question like this, uh, the system first of all retrieves tuples from its uh, knowledge base of tuples and also on the fly from a text corpus. So it might retrieve, say, uh, waves often re result in erosion. Storms can generate waves. 
And then there's a transformation process where we replace the, uh, the verb phrase in the uh, relation here with one of 20 uh, formal relations from a, a small ontology of relations. So these might get transformed to waves cause erosion, storms cause waves. And then there's a chaining process which goes on where we have a set of rules that relate these 20 relationships together. Uh, so for instance, that uh, causes is a transitive relation. And so we can derive some inferred tuples like storms cause erosion. And then at the last stage, the system forms a support graph using all these tuples to try to align all the tuples it's retrieved with a question kind of as illustrated up here. And we use inductive logic programming to, uh, to try and find the optimal support graph subject to a set of constraints, and there's some hard and soft constraints, and they're constraints like um, the tuples should cover as many of the question words as possible, and at least one tuple should cover a question and an answer word together. And so this is the way this, this algorithm works. Uh, we have a specialist solver for answering qualitative reasoning questions. So this is an unusual solver, and this only fires when it sees qualitative questions like this one. Why does a toy car roll further than a wood block? Sorry, why does a toy car roll further on a wood floor than on a thick carpet? And the answer here is the floor has less resistance. So when we see a question like this, we uh, immediately think, okay, this is about friction and distance and so on. So we have some qualitative knowledge that we bring to bear to answer this. Um, in the early versions of this solver, we hand built some of these relationships. And in the newer version of this system, we extract uh, a large number of qualitative relationships from uh, open domain text. And then what the reasoner does using neural techniques is to align uh, phrases in the question with these qualitative relationships. Like roll further means there's more distance, and less resistance means the friction is down, and so on. So it can come up with the, uh, with the correct answer. And then finally, we have a solver called multi which relies on textual entailments. And the idea here is there are, there are many good systems out there for doing textual entailment. Can we reuse them for multiple choice question answering? And it's not quite a, a straightforward mapping because multiple choice questions have several options. There might be multiple sentences providing evidence. And so again, very briefly, uh, what, what multi does is to find relevant sentences, assess their relevance to the question, it then computes the entailments of those sentences with the question, and that aggregates that information together to come up with an overall entailment decision for each of the different answer options. And uh, this has proved to be quite effective uh, at answering the science questions. This is what it looks like for a, a science question, which substance is a compound, a table salts. This is the answer it's selected. And here's some of the sentences it's uh, identified as partially entailing the table salt answer and the scores it's provided. Um, and then finally, the language model solvers, the ones we've been adding this year. Um, uh, this is using Bert and Roberta. So what we do is we, uh, we take a sentence, sorry, we take a question and uh, each one of its answer options in turn. So we'll take a question and one answer option. We'll then do an information retrieval step to retrieve a set of relevant information from our text corpus. And then we feed this into, into BERT in this format. So CLS token, the context, which is the retrieves information, the question and the answer option. So the system kind of processes all this. And then um, the CLS token is projected onto a logit for this, this particular answer option. We do the same for each of the answers. And then we do a, so, a softmax over them all and then pick the, uh, the, the, uh, the most confident answer as a result. And this has proved to be uh, very effective for us. Is there any reason you don't do end-to-end -end, um, matching in the embedded space? That you do the IR as a first step? So just computation? Oh, you mean just... Uh, um, you mean doing IR as part of the end-to-end? -end? Not doing IR as part of it. Um, so we've tried this without doing IR. It does quite a lot worse, um, which is... Um, and I can show you the figures. It's okay. about 15%. Worse, so uh, it might be just that um, we have about ten thousand science questions we're training on that just might not be enough signal to provide the, the information that's needed. Um, uh, clearly, the extra inf information from the retrieval is is helping here. 
Yeah. yeah. Kind of the converse of that question. Have you experimented much with just Google by being <laughs> Google with some heuristic, various heuristic matching strategies? I don't know how high that baseline is, but it seems like it must be very high for this kind of question. Oh, just, so just looking on Google, those people with, you know, so that would be. I was asking you about this. Throwing the potential answers at it. Yeah, so that would be essentially the equivalent of our IR system, which is using a web crawl. But it's not a big web crawl, right? Your system's using the right. Web crawl. So um, we could do that with maybe programming. Yeah, I, 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 so our IR system that scores that about seventy really percent on the eighth grade exams. I um, so we haven't systematically measured that with with Google. I I. I, I don't think it would get a lot more. Maybe maybe it would get up to 75% or... We should try, or, we should try That would be great if you guys tried it. So I guess, Peter, it's sort of the broader question. I think when you and I discussed this uh -huh. uh, at AI2, the um, broad question is this. So I mean, I'll frame it up. You've been working on this really interesting uh, and intriguing challenge for 15 years, I'm guessing. Maybe 17. <laughs> uh, and... and um, and before the large uh, DNNs and so on, um, uh, you were working through lots of interesting machinery on the reasoning side, coupled with IR of various kinds, uh, mm -hmm. as an inference. Um, and then something like BERT shows up. Then you kind of, okay, well, you have all this great work you've done on the chaining and reasoning and the machinery, which all makes a lot of sense and it's still struggling huffing and puffing against the questions. Uh -huh. uh, and you plug Bird in, and all of a sudden, boom, pop. And the question that comes up is, um, I have two questions, actually. For, the first one is, um, and we, we don't have to pause and we can continue yeah. the talk, but it's maybe some broader questions. The first one is, uh, are the answers being answered correctly for the right reasons? Mm -hmm. yeah. In other words, when, it's, when an examiner asks these questions of a, of a and, and they form a questions for the students, they're testing certain kinds of reasoning abilities and states of knowledge and how, how human beings put things together, not necessarily testing a massive correlative engine, its, its abilities to correlate phrases and words. That would really disappoint the, the regents examiners, I think, you know, if that's all that was being done in the head of a, of a young man or a woman. Um, and the second question is, if you just had bird and you hadn't done all what you'd done, um, and you just came at this naively, looking for associational knowledge to, to, to bootstrap up the answer to these questions. And you said, well, I never, I never built all that chaining stuff and all these really great ideas that were actually really good ideas, just fighting against a real hard problem. Would it, would it, would it have been an easier entry point to seeing if you can get like 85, 90% just burnt alone with a little bit of like IR and some tiny bits of work versus trying to harness all that you've done in the past and then add burnt to it. Those two questions. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's <laughs> um, so that's true. So in a way, uh, language models have almost superseded a lot of the earlier work. And right. so one of our, so and I'll, I'll jump ahead and show you the, I mean, you, you may have seen the numbers in the, in the paper, the, the, the earlier methods are adding a very thin layer of icing on top, but it's, but it's not particularly, particularly thick. And so the, so the interesting question then is exactly as you say, you know, is BERT doing what these other systems were doing or is it doing something different? And, and, and would, would the BERT style of um, massive, uh, you know, uh, associational uh, capability, mm -hmm. Please, please, Regents Examiner, in probing the intelligence of an agent, um, per the kind of machinery, the, the machinery you were working on before would be the kind of machinery the, the examiners would be interested in what you know, humans could do with more general purpose abilities when it comes to knowledge and how they put things together. And so that's an interesting question, that, you know, sort of, we, well, we, 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 you know, with, you know, uh, Right, and it, 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 the, 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 the people at the, with the test questions are not necessarily, they're getting at some bill set of general intelligence capabilities and mm -hmm. plus knowledge, not at like, can people do a massive quick set of lookups and then uh, write down tables of numbers and then add them together and, and say, 
I think it's of these four question answers, it's this one more likely. Yeah, I, th I think to, to, <laughs> for the majority, the examiners would not be would not be satisfied because the exams are meant to test, you know, does does this person have an understanding of science, right. and the tests are meant to be a proxy for that, right. and so the question is, you know, does you know, Bert or Aristo Bert, is it understanding science at all, or is it doing so, so, um, something? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so what I'm going to do? Let me. I'm going to jump ahead to talk about that analysis because we've done quite a lot of probing of what's going on to try to answer that and say, but is my, it? My intuition is don't throw away your old work just yet. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's good to hear. Um, and in, in particular. The cases where Bert fails are very interesting yeah. um, because that shows that some degree of structured reasoning is, is needed. I mean, you know, my, my sort of belief is that we need, you know, systems do have some kind of, humans have ability to do systematic reasoning and we need that in our language models. And there are very clear cases where uh, even Bert falls flat on its face because it doesn't have that capability. Um, now, whether that's systematic reasoning, I, so I, I don't believe it's now deductive logic that's needed for that. Rather, there's a sort of soft linguistic reasoning that we're capable of doing in a soft sense that uh, so I think language models probably could be trained to do and maybe done in the future. Yeah, just, uh, to the extent that these associative models do do really, really well in this test, it may say something more about the test itself than right. whether yeah. these That's standardized right. tests favor that kind of Right, and, and for sure. Um, there's there's sort of limitations in multiple choice tests uh, that have been... Uh, the test tends to just be structured around that kind of knowledge, yeah. and people who have a lot of that associative knowledge do well on them. Right. And it may not be really testing fundamental understanding of scientific concepts like right. traction. Right. Friction and that kind of thing. No, but, uh, but, I, but I think that I, I would put it that differently. You're saying people who have social, social knowledge do all these kinds of tests. I think it's quite the opposite. I think human beings don't have big corpuses of necessarily social knowledge. They actually can't actually, actually reason. So for the, for the mind of the bounded rational student, the tests are actually Maybe. forcing them to do some reason. But, but, but they're not forcing birth into reason. They're forcing birth to just spit out statistics. Well, I, but let me... People have huge memories. Some of it is reading text. Some of it is interacting with the real world. And um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know that it, it's not uh, I, I mean, an I interesting mean be, match. I, I mean, between, to be dogmatic about not. Yeah. But I'm saying, sure, there's intuitions there, but there's some also... Because they, they don't have a massive birth model necessarily in their brains, potentially. They're actually forced to do a little bit of reasoning. Right, but I think, yes. but, but, but there's, there is a question. There is a question about whether Bert is doing some kind of reasoning. I mean, to get, you know, I, I so. to get up to 60, 60 or seventy percent on the exams, you probably can get away with just matching. But I think there's a bit more going on, which I can I can talk about. So I'm going to I'm just going to skip to to talk about that. So this is <clears throat> this is the breakdown of the scores on our different exams: the fourth, eighth, and twelfth grade science. And then our um, AI2 reasoning challenge data sets, which are much bigger data sets of science questions. And what you can, here's Aristo at the end, here's the individual solvers. And what you can see, as we just discussed, most of the heavy lifting is being done by the, uh, um, by the language models. And so there's an interesting question here of, you know, what's going on here? Um, is it doing anything clever or is it just doing sort of glorified matching? So um, um, that's what I, let me switch to talk about that because I think this is probably for this audience is the most uh, interesting bit. Um, so one thing that's been observed in the literature is about annotation artifacts that uh, uh, particularly if uh, humans write questions or Turkers write questions, uh, sometimes there are giveaways that uh, show what the right answer is. So one test is uh, how well can Aristo do if we hide the question and just give it the answer options? Um, so friction, light, force, or weather, you know, what's the right answer? I don't know, maybe a neural system could figure it out. When we give this to the system, uh, it's scoring only 37%. Um, so random guessing is 25%. So in some ways, this is, uh, this is very reassuring. This low score is reassuring in that, at least in science exams, there doesn't appear to be any sort of obvious uh, uh, 
uh, annotation artifacts in the in the answer options. Well, for the twelfth grade exams, it's pretty high. It's fifty percent. Uh, for the twelfth grade, uh, yeah, it's nearly. I guess nearly fifty percent. So actually, that's quite that's quite interesting. Yeah. So, um, though that's still um, quite a lot lower than, lower than uh, ninety percent, of course. Um, so some some annotation artifacts there. Um, and then the second question is, can we fool Aristo by giving obviously wrong answers? So here's a question Aristo gets right. Uh, the condition of the air outdoors at a certain time of day is known as what? The answer is weather. Um, so now we can adversarially add additional answer options. So we pick answer options from other questions that um, uh, are picked deliberately uh, because they confuse the system. So dual gradient, trench, and add heat. These are options that a, a human would uh, uh, not be distracted by. And in fact, Aristo does get confused by these. Um, uh, so it picks gradient in this particular case. Um, it's a little bit of an unfair test, but by definition, we've picked answers which will confuse it. So a fairer test is to then say, okay, let's re-fine tune the system with a large number of questions like this. Uh, and indeed, when we do this, for the most part, it does recover its uh, performance. Um, in terms of statistics, we go from about 69% uh, on the whole battery of tests down to 59%. So it's dropping about 10 points score on these uh, adversarially picked uh, uh, data sets. Um, of course, we're going from full way to eight way, which makes it uh, a bit more challenging. Um, so arguably, when Arista was originally trained, um, it had never seen crazy answers, and it didn't know how to deal with them. When we fine tune it with a lot of crazy answers, it learns to spot crazy answers and can do better on this. Um, there's an interesting question as well about, oh, sorry, yes, go ahead. Like just out of curiosity, yeah. did you also try, because you picked the answers that it would get wrong. Right. Did you also try just doing another model that you start from like a different random seed? Just like, is it the retraining that's mattering or is it just kind of shifting the weights around a little bit so that it's not so adversarial? Um, so we tried, we've, we've retrained it. We've run this several times, if that's what you mean. So what I, I mean is, so there's, there's two options. One, one is that it's the retraining to understand like these types of weird answers are wrong. Right. That's what you're hypothesizing. Yep. The other option is because you picked for this particular model which ones it would get wrong, it may be that like if the weights were just slightly different, it would oh, know I that see. those are all wrong because you picked like just for that model. And mm -hmm. it may be that like if you just shuffle the weights a little or retrain from a different, train originally from a different seed. Right, right. Um, that it would still know that those are wrong. Yeah, no, I don't think it's, I don't think it's the latter. I guess we've, we've used BERT to generate the adversaries and then used the data set to retrain on Roberta and vice versa. So, um, so I don't think it's just like it's uh, a model specific it's phenomenon. It's not using the exact model to pick the bad answer. That's it's right. It's using a slightly different Exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm still thinking about artifacts of the uh -huh. test itself, and I'm wondering: Have you looked? At, I assume for the Regents' exam, there are there are books that people can buy or websites yeah. people can go to for how to game the test. Have you looked at those to try to get a sense of what strategies, what sort of low end acts people use to do well on this? Yeah, I. So I know general multiple choice strategies are out there. Things yeah. like you know. If you don't know the answer, try to at least exclude one. And yeah. if you're not, you know, if there are three numbers are similar, then it's probably one of those three. Um, what kind of cues, superficial cues, might help? Yeah, we didn't find anything that was particularly helpful there. Um, I think the, I think the, you know, the biggest cues might be just kind of our word correlations enough right. to to answer these questions without understanding science. Um, so, um, and actually on that sort of word correlation aspect, so this is one of our questions, this is the one I mentioned earlier. And if I, and actually I can hopefully demonstrate this on the, on the real system, if I give this to Aristo itself and it chugs away, so it comes up with the right answer. So this is the question, city administrators can encourage energy conservation by uh, lowering the cost of bus and subway fares. So the interesting thing is if I edit the question here, I'm going to change uh, lowering to uh, uh, raising and uh, decreasing to increasing. So I'm changing the kind of polarity of some of these words. If I ask Aristo this question again, 
it's now changed its answer and it's picked uh, increasing the cost of gasoline. So this is kind of surprising. So it's not just doing some macro bag of words. It's being sensitive to these little little changes here. And um, can you just try that query one? Just grab the city administrators can encourage part. And try it on uh, Bing or Google. Oh. Uh, uh, I can try. Well, let me see what I can do it, here. It'll bring up Peter Clark's triple A. It might. You have to worry that if all these answers and questions are out there, you should do Well, that's right. There's, there's I'm right. just curious to see whether... City administrators can encourage energy conservation by... Do you want me to just type that? Yeah, but whatever. <clears throat> Let's see what we've got here. Just see if you find more buses or um, parking. Okay, we have install electric vehicle chargers. Um, it's the very first advoc- result. The very first yeah. result. Question. Do away with... Well, public public transport. Yeah. So ease on public light, buses, yeah. and mitts. Okay. I think it's a, it's a fun... Okay. You want to try it? So there's some, some knowledge there. So... I mean, the the important point that I wanted to make th- uh, on this question was not l- less the um, specifics of the... Uh, um, of this question, and more the, the system was uh, sensitive to the uh, flipping polarity where I was switching the uh, switching the uh, switching the uh, um, uh, increase into decreasing, and then another one which is interesting. And I'll, again, I'll see if I can uh, uh, submit this one. And now I've, I'm just going to have to let's see, pull this over here. So let's see if I can. Um, I've got the split screen here. So which of the following organs does a squirrel not have? A brain, gills, a heart, or lungs? And so the system correctly says squirrel doesn't have gills. Now if I uh, ask the question again, I'm just going to take out the negation here, trying to uh, do this on the screen here, and it chugs away. And now it's changed its answer to lungs. So again, it shows some sort of sensitivity to negations. So... That, that's, that's kind of interesting, and the, and the question there is whether, um, uh, you know, is this just a fluke, or is there something systematic uh, going on? And so we've, um, we've done a few probes to look at some of these features. So we're looking at uh, negation, conjunction, polarity, world tracking, and so on, uh, to see how it behaves. Yeah? Right, just a clarifying yeah. question. Is this the whole Arista system, or just the BERT part? It's it's uh, it's a subset. It's the Burt part plus two or three other solvers, but it's mainly mainly the Burt part is what you. The part alone does do this. Yeah, but. that's right. It's the it's the Burt part. Yeah. So, to test negation, for instance, we created a synthetic data set of state of uh, questions like this, where we give some backgrounds like. Alan is small, Alan is tall, Bob is big, Bob is tall, and so on. And then, which of the following is not tall? Alan, Bob, Charlie, or in this case, David. And when we give this to Aristo, to the Aristo Burt system, without any fine tuning on this, so we're not, we're not trying to see whether Burt can learn these. We're trying to see, does it just know these from its science training? Uh, we find it gets 94% on this. So it seems, at least on this, tr- this is a sort of imperfect trial. At least in this context, it really seems to understand about negation here. So we'll give it an A there. Um, for conjunction, we created this data set where, we, again, we've got similar statements about people. And we ask questions like, which of the following is big and blue? And uh, the answer here is, is Charlie. And again, when we look at the scores over this data set, with one conjunct, it's getting 98%. And so then going right up to four conjuncts, it's getting about 80% of them right. So it's doing some kind of reasoning with these conjuncts. And then if we throw in a negation, the scores go down a little bit. But even with four conjuncts and one negation, it's scoring 75% on this data set. And as I say, this is without fine-tuning on this data set. It's just throwing the data set as is to Aristo. So this is an example of this last one. So we have a lot of context, and we ask, which of the following is uh, old and red and light and big and not short? And then we have a bunch of answers, and the answer is... Um, well, I'll let, you, I'll let you guys work it out. I think, I think it's Alan in this case. Um, so we'll give it a B plus here. Um, for polarity, um, this is the flipping that I described. So we have 
contexts like sounds has a slower speed at lower temperatures, then we have a question like, if Jim turned the thermostat down in his room while listening to music, what will happen to the speed of sounds? And the answer is um, sound waves, they'll slow down. And what we want to see is whether Aristo can get this correct. And if we flip the polarity, so we change down to up, uh, which flips the answer option, will it also get the flipped answer correct? So it's got to get both of them correct in order to score a point. And when we do that, we find, surprisingly again, it gets about 67% of these uh, correct, uh, which is, uh, again, pretty interesting. And again, showing it's not just sort of doing some sort of glorified word matching. So we'll give it a D plus. We know from experiments, if we fine tune on this data set, it gets scores up in the 90%. Um, but just out of the box, it's, it's getting uh, uh, about 60%. And world tracking is where there are questions. It's a certain breed of questions where you need to follow two different entities through a story. <coughs> so an example here is, uh, John and Rita are going for a run. Rita gets tired and takes a break on the park bench. After 20 minutes in the park, who has run further? And the answer is John. But if we switch Rita for John here, we would uh, get a different answer. And the system gets about 72% on these difficult questions, which is higher than our best system that we built painstakingly a couple of years ago on this data set. So we'll give it a C. Uh, factivity. These are uh, factive verbs where verbs that make a presupposition about what follows. So if something, someone regretted that a particular thing happens, then, you know, did it happen or not? The system gets about 66% on that. And finally, on counting, we use the, the Babby data set for counting, where we have questions like, um, Daniel picked up the football, Daniel dropped the football, Daniel got the milk. How many objects is Daniel holding? Uh, Arista was terrible at this. It had no idea at all. It got 6% on this because it kept on choosing a very rare answer option 3 all the time. So it gets an F on this. Um, so the, the, the bottom line here is that there's more going on here than just sort of bag of words matching or syntax alignment. The system has some knowledge about some of these logical operators, but it's not systematic in the way people reason with it. It's sort of approximating the behavior we'd like to see. Um, so that raises a lot of interesting questions about, you know, do we consider this reasoning? Would the examiner be happy to see that it's being able to do some of this uh, conjunctive stuff? So finally, let me just talk about where, um, where Aristo fails. So there's some interesting insights here. So if you recall, we give a question and an answer option. We retrieve some text. It sort of reads it and then comes up with an answer. Um, it's interesting to look at the text that's retrieved for cases where it gets the answer wrong and, and ask, um, did it get the answer wrong because um, it just simply wasn't given the knowledge? Or did it have the right knowledge from information retrieval, but somehow it's uh, not able to correctly make sense of it? So we did a study of 30 failures, and we find actually only in four cases there's good support for the correct answer. Um, so most that, that means in almost all the cases where the retrieval is providing good support for the right answer, it's actually picking that answer. So that's uh, um, quite surprising that it's able to kind of untangle the language. Um, one case, there was good support for the incorrect answer. Uh, most of the times, uh, there was no good support. And these are questions which are, um, this isn't necessarily a failure of IR. These may just be questions where you need several disparate bits of information which just don't look at all like the question and answer. And so it's not pulling, not retrieving them, and it may or may not be able to pull them together. And then there were eight cases where the question was actually more of a reading comprehension uh, quest, re reading comprehension task within the question itself, and that's something that uh, the IR-based approach is, is not particularly going to help with. So just to show you some examples of these, um, this is an example of a question which confused Aristo. Um, which is the best unit to measure distances between Earth and other solar systems in the universe? Is it light years or astronomical units? So... Um, it picked astronomical units based on what this one of these. This is one of the retrieved sentences for that incorrect option. In general, distances in the solar system are measured in astronomical units. Uh, there is good support for the correct answer, which is light years. So you can see here, Arista's got confused about the difference between 
measuring distances within the solar system versus distances between solar systems. So this is um, you know, one of the less common cases where it's not paid attention to the, the nuances of the language properly. Do you have normative data of what people do? Um, we, what students do? We, we don't have the, we know the precise scores on, on, the, on the whole exams. Uh, regions don't publish the, just the, you know, scores on the multiple choice, um, um, the individual multiple choice questions. Um, uh, I suspect, yeah, I, uh, that might be an interesting study. I, I suspect it would be less than 90% on average. It is confusing. Yeah, this is, uh, we, can, we can be gentle on Aristo for getting this yeah. p particular one wrong. Because you, you have to read the question carefully. Um, just glancing at the words is not enough. Um, here's a question where there was good support for the incorrect answer. <clears throat> so which of these objects will float in water? Uh, a hard rubber ball, which it's selected, or a table tennis ball? And so there's actually retrieved sentences which says rubber balls float. Um, Arguably, Aristo still shouldn't have chosen this because it's, the question says which is most likely comparing different answer options. But the way Aristo is built is it treats each answer option individually, and so it can't compare the, uh, compare the two. Um, most interestingly are questions where there was no good support for the correct answer um, uh, because the question has a degree of complication that... Uh, there just isn't a good s supporting sentence in the corpus. So uh, this example I mentioned at the beginning, how are the particles in the block of iron affected when the block is melted? So there are sentences in the corpus that will say temperature affects particle movement, and there are sentences which talk about temperature uh, being related to melting, but these don't get retrieved here uh, because the kind of key pivoting word temperature is not mentioned in the question. And so the system fails here. So this is an example where some sort of multi-step retrieval or multi-hop reasoning is needed. Sometimes we get questions like this, uh, which require question decomposition. So uh, the question here is, an eagle and a pelican are different. What is one difference between them? Uh, it picks their method of reproduction. The correct answer is their method of catching food. The retreat information is completely hopeless here. It picks all sorts of random things about eagles and pelicans. Um, and clearly to answer this, uh, there's a structure to this question that the system is completely oblivious to, and it's uh, not being able to, to uh, pick that up and decompose it. Um, another complicated question here, which characteristic applies to animals in only one of these taxonomic categories? Uh, reptiles, mammals, birds, amphibians or fishes, the answer is half hair and it picks lays egg, eggs. And again, the information retrieval doesn't pick anything uh, correct because of uh, um, all these different features uh, being combined together. Really, the system should go out, should realize there's a comparison going on, should go and get properties of reptiles and mammals one by one. So again, there's more structured understanding of the question that's needed here. And then finally, which geological structure which will most likely take the longest to form? Uh, and again, the system isn't able to compare uh, different answer options side by side. It's scoring each individually. Well, but if the scores are calibrated, it should, does it matter? Um, well, it should... I guess the question is longest time with respect to what? So... Uh, it'll score a mountain range, uh, you know, is a mountain range a geological structure that takes the longest time to form, is the question it's trying to answer. And is a river meander likely to take the longest time to form? Um, so the answer, you know, longest with respect to what? Um, there are story questions. So these are questions, there are a few questions where you have to actually read and comprehend the, uh, the question and then ask about it. So this is a question about doing an experiment. And the question is, what is the independent variable in this investigation? So clearly doing information retrieval is completely irrelevant to this question, and it doesn't manage to handle it. And then these meta sentiment questions it struggles with, which statement is an opinion? Uh, it thinks plant requires sunlight is the answer. Of course, many plants are beautiful. And again, this isn't something that retrieval is likely to, to help with. 
And then finally, this one I thought was really interesting. How long does it take for the moon to complete one revolution around the Earth? Uh, the answer is 30 days. It picks 365 days. These are the sentences it retrieves, and it has a lot of sentences giving precise uh, times that the moon orbits around the Earth, but it's completely unable to realize 27.3 is similar to 30, and so it goes to 365. Yeah. Is that like a possible bias? Because most of the time when we ask about something, completing around something, it's usually about the Earth, around the Sun. Um, so um, I think it's, it's not, not quite a bias. So um, it's correctly picked statements here about the Moon orbiting around the Earth. For the um, 360, well, I guess there's a little bit about it. For the 365 day answer, it has picked up sentences about the Earth orbiting around the Sun. Um, so that's where that answer's come from. Um, and I guess it's just decided that matches better than these answers because it doesn't see any sort of alignment of the numerics. Yeah, that's a good point. So, yeah. So, so let me so um, let me talk about just just finding steps forward and what, like what needs to be done. So, I would say in summary, uh, what I've shown so far. Um, the surprising, Bert has shown a surprising ability to answer questions. It's clearly doing more than just uh, matching. There's some hints of reasoning, uh, simple reasoning going on, um, but that reasoning is not systematic, it's, uh, it's partial. And there are, there are clearly classes of questions where it completely falls flat. So how do we get beyond that to answer questions which uh, uh, deal with those? And I'll just mention, um, uh, very quickly, th uh, th um, th three areas. So the first is question decomposition. So this is another example question. Which virus structure is similar in function to a cell membrane? The retrieved answer tells nothing, talks of nothing about virus structure and nothing about cell membranes. What's needed is a system that can decompose the question to say, well, what's the function of a cell membrane? It surrounds and protects. What parts of the virus surrounds and protects? It's the protein shell, and then we get the answer. Uh, so this is something we're working on at the moment, uh, trying to get to, to some sort of structured representation of the question. Uh, the second aspect is this multi-hot reasoning, where we need to do multi-step retrieval. So what conducts electricity? Suit of armor or cotton candy? So there's no sentences saying suit of armor conducts electricity. Instead, we need to do some retrieval about uh, conducting electricity. And then pivot off what we found there to look for other facts which are relevant to the question. And now we can try to form chains of reasoning. So taking each of these paths here through these retrieved sentences constitutes a, a, a chain of inference. So suit of armor is made from metal, and metal conducts electrical current. Uh, might imply suit of armor conducts electricity. So this would be a good chain. There are other connections just pivoting through the words that are not good uh, chains, so this would be a bad example. And so we'd want to train the system to then recognize good paths of connectivity between sentences from bad paths to recognize the good chains. So this is trying to get to some degree of language-like inference to answer some of these questions. Um, third thing is modeling world states. So Aristo, it kind of knows about science, or at least it knows a lot of facts about science. It doesn't make any attempt to model the world. Um, so when we read a passage like this about photosynthesis, uh, we create a sort of mental picture of what's going on in the world. So roots absorb water from the soil. Uh, we'll imagine there's, okay, there's some water now at the roots. The water flows to the leaf. We'll imagine the water flows to the leaf. And we'll um, create this mental picture of what's going on at each step, how things are changing. The, the machine is not able to do that. So, you know, if I ask you, okay, where's the sugar created? You'll say, well, of course it's created the leaf because everything's flowing to the leaf in our mental picture, uh, uh, running by DAF, for simple uh, uh, um, span prediction system on this, so as light water and CO2. Uh, so the neural systems have no envisionment about the world and how the world is changing. So this is something that, again, I think we need going forward. And then finally, um, uh, explanation and instruction. So humans can not just answer questions, we can explain our reasoning, 
And we're not just post hoc rationalizing because somebody can come and tell us that we're wrong and we can change our reasoning. So we'd like our systems to be able to do the same thing. So if I ask you, can you pick up a penny with a magnet or ask Aristo, Aristo may say yes. I'll say why. Uh, and the system might say, well, pennies are made of metal and metals are magnetic. So here's some sort of rationalization or explanation about why it came up with the answer. We'd like to be able to come back to it and correct some of its misunderstandings and say, well, actually, not all metals are magnetic. Copper is not magnetic. Try again. And then have the system say, OK, now I think the answer is no, because pennies are made of copper and copy, copper is not magnetic. So this is the kind of interactive... So this requires not just answering questions, but explanation and the ability for a user to correct the system on top of that. So just to summarize, as I said before, we have surprising success. As, a, as I've pointed out, this mainly reflects the rapid progress of NLP. And I've argued that we're doing not just pattern matching, there's more going on, but it's falling short with some compositional questions. And there's many other aspects of AI, which uh, examiners would want that uh, uh, the system's not doing. And what do we need going forward? Well, we want to reintroduce some sort of structured reasoning, but I think not with the sort of formal logic structures, the, the ones I've uh, uh, spent years working with in the past, but more uh, language-like representations to do the kind of semi-formal uh, uh, structured reasoning that people do. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Very interesting talk. Uh, thank you. you mentioned that the performance drops if you don't feed in the IR output. Yes, yes, right. Where to just feed the question and the answer? What type of performance? Would yeah. Have? So I sorry I skipped over that bit. So, um, uh, so if we just take BERTs and then we fine tune it on questions and answers, it scored sixty seven percent on its own uh, on the. Uh, um, uh, on the eighth grade science exams. So that's about 20 points lower than using the IR. I should say 67% is still pretty good. You know, it's still comparable to the IR systems. Um, but the IR is playing a significant role. When you, can I just follow up? Yeah. yeah. So when you do that, you ask... You ask a the question with one of the answers. Is that what you give to the right? So essentially, the so you compute the similarity between the question and one of its alternatives. Um, that's right. We'd feed we'd feed uh, the question plus answer into Bert and uh, and get the use the CLS token to get a score, and then we do that for the four answer options, uh, and so on. Yeah, math. So I think it's it's really interesting this this idea. The, I like the probing for like polarity and so forth. It's showing that the system is learning, sort of implicitly or by accident through the training. It's learning to handle and or or, or not or whatever. Um, so I'm curious. So I have two questions. One is, did did the Bert part already have that knowledge in it before you did the training on the science exam? Like, could it already handle kind of and and not and so forth? Or do you think the training was a key part of that? Um, so. Um, we, so we, b before we train on the science exams, we train on the race data set, which is a general comprehension data set. Uh, we know after training on race, it still has a lot of these capabilities. Um, so um, I suspect that knowledge of Andenor has come from the original training of the original model. Um, of the race trained model? No, I think that, uh, even before that. So I think Bert has the some Bert. of that. Okay knowledge about and we've, we've not explicitly tested that so what we'd have to do is to so it could have picked it up using the race data sets um, we would have to train maybe just on a small number of race questions so it learned to do multiple choice and then see uh, whether it could do the conjunction and the negation that would that would be a very interesting test my, my suspicion is it learned it in the original or you could train on questions that don't have conjunction and see if it can handle conjunction or something. Right. Yeah. That's true. Uh, I don't know how many of the race questions involve conjunction and, and negation, whether yeah. that's where it picks it up. And then I think the second part of the question is, um, so you're, you're kind of depending on the 10,000 science questions to create the necessity for it to understand how to handle polarity. But if you think this is an important concept, you could kind of, I don't know, generate 
generate data, try to shove it in there, you know, automatically? Is that something you guys are looking at? Yeah, yeah, indeed. And actually, our test of polarity was using two data sets that we uh, generated to to test this kind of to develop qualitative reasoning systems. And you're exactly right. So. Um, uh, the, the scorecard I showed was without fine-tuning on those data sets. We could fine-tune the system on those data sets to improve its performance. That's something we're looking at doing now. Um, um, whether that would improve its performance further, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, maybe it would. I mean, there's an interesting question whether, you know, to get really good performance on a variety of tasks, you just fine-tune on... 50 different skills you want the system to have. I mean, you have to hope there's no sort of catastrophic forgetting of the uh, original tasks, but uh, that seems to be or a... Or you could do multitask or multi something. Task. Or you could do multitask, yeah. Yeah, not, not fine-tune on polarity for the purpose of doing polarity, but fine-tune yeah. on polarity for the purpose of answering science questions. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it requires the, the fine-tuning to be a similar nature to the science questions as well. So whether our synthetic, uh, like our negation, our synthetic conjunction tests are similar enough to science tra to transfer, I don't know. Yeah. Again, interesting area to think about. Yeah. Yeah, good, good question. Uh, one, you probably already answered this in the question before. When you say BERT has like 67% accuracy, uh, was it after pre-training the language model and fine-tuning it for your given task? Or you just took the BERT that is trained offline and applied to your task? No, no, it's fine-tuned it's fine on the task. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then the second question is, should we place more uh, focus on evaluating such systems, like just going away from the F score, measuring how it came to the answer, especially like since you're building a lot of these deductive and inductive re uh, reasoning and these solvers. Right. So should the focus of the community be more on evaluating, like just moving away from the F score or right. just saying, just um, focus on that? Um, so, so absolutely, I think the... Um, as, as somebody mentioned here, one one thing, this, as well as showing that <coughs> language models are good, this also shows some of the limitations of exams as a, a measure of um, uh, testing whether somebody has understood science. Um, our, our big push next year is going to be into explanation. So, so um, if a system can explain itself, that adds some reassurance that the system has... Uh, you know, is not just getting the answer for the wrong reasons, um, but it's actually doing something sensible. Um, there's a caveat with explanations as well, in that explanations can be gameable. Um, it turns out, you know, in the past, people have built systems that can generate explanations just by, again, retrieving sentences on the web uh, that can convince a human examiner it's doing the right thing. So it's not a, it's not a panacea adding explanations into the mix, but absolutely important direction to go. Yeah. Are you also thinking about kind of casting the task a little bit differently in that not really being able to choose one of the four options, yeah. but generating the answer? Yeah, uh, very much so. So I think uh, um, this also shows that multiple choice is uh, somewhat flawed as a style of a question to pursue. And this has been... Uh, uh, many people in the NLP community have been banging their heads against the wall but with every new multiple choice data set being sold by BERT in six months' time. So, yeah, I think moving to direct answers uh, is uh, absolutely the, the right direction to move. From an educational perspective, I feel yeah. like a lot of times it's like a shortcut that we take. In yeah, education. that's right. And, and multiple choice <laughs> questions, are, um, they're, they're not a particularly useful form of question answering, you know, so if, you, if we wanted Aristo to evolve into a tutoring system or a, uh, uh, a scientist's assistant, uh, multiple choice is not the way to go. It needs to be able to do direct answers. Absolutely. Let's sit at the back. So this is about the nature of the task that you're <coughs> setting uh, Aristo about. So I don't know how the examiners in New York State would feel about a test where that was totally open book where the people coming in had access to all the information on the internet and all the time they wanted to answer each question. Uh, I would think that that would not be measuring what they're interested in. Um, and in previous generations of AI, we had ideas that the knowledge should actually be in the system, not in the web. Um, so is there an interest in 
pursuing the question of a self-contained system where having the knowledge in it and not just having in it the means to extract knowledge well, from elsewhere is, uh, is that on the books in your... Well, it's a little bit of a fuzzy boundary about what it means to have a self-contained system. So, so Aristo is self-contained. It doesn't go out to the web. It has its own corpus. I mean, that's a third of a terabyte. Um, we could have embedded that corpus within a neural model. Um, so, and then, you know, is it, is it now self-contained or not? I'm, I'm not sure. So, uh, so it's a little bit... That's question that has to be confronted. It's not something that can't be confronted, I think. Um, the, uh, uh, I mean, it's hard if you say, okay, the system can't use any external knowledge, but do you then put boundaries on what's inside? So, so is this allowed to have a third, of a, you know, a third of a terabyte of text? So you say, well, no, that's too much. But then we internalize this into a neural system. You know, is that okay? It's, anyway, it's, it's a... I, I do see. I, I do see what you're getting. In some ways, you could argue Aristo cheating because it's sort of going out and looking up the answer rather than working it out itself. Um, but in a way, you know, if people have memorized the textbooks, they're sort of doing the the same thing as well. Yeah, everybody who interviews for a developer position is reading, cracking, coding. <laughs> 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 Um, this is maybe very hard to, to assess, but so going back to, so let's say I don't care about the 90%. I mean, let's talk about just the fact that you have a, a, a reasoning system that's at the 60s and I have a BERT model that's in the 60s, right? And I don't know why BERT necessarily is in the 60s. Um, is there a way to then use the fact that you have a comparison system to do introspection? So for example, if I... Like I think Noah has a new paper where they rearrange the attention, the self-attention in the linear layers inside the transformer, and they get the same perplexity on, on um, like language modeling. So maybe you have the same perplexity on language modeling, but you can no longer do reasoning. Um, and so was it the fact that you really do have to do an iterative sort of process of attention and, and, and mapping or something like this in order to simulate the kind of reasoning that you can do, or is there ways to sort of start to kind of so you have a real system. Can we look at this neural network one and see if we can figure out how it's approximating yeah. behavior? Um, yeah, that's a really good question as well. Um, so I can think of two things. One is if we have a sort of systematic way of solving a problem. Well, like this this question about the um, uh, the parking, the um, the bus fares, and the environment. You say, well, does then we have a reasoning system which will chase. Uh, trace the chain through qualitative relationships. So we could actually ask, given, given we know at least one chain, we could ask Aristo for each of those links. You know, does it know each of those links in, in this chain? And hopefully it does. If it doesn't, then somehow it's uh, doing, doing something else. So that would be one way. In other words, the reasoning system could serve as a so source of sub-questions to kind of probe the way an examiner would to try and tease out, you know, did you know the sub-facts? I think the other thing, which is like, you, you mentioned kind of brain surgery on the, uh, the actual neural system. Uh, so we're looking at some of that to see whether, you know, within the different layers, within transformers, are there, particularly for the multi-hop questions, are there, is there any evidence that some of these kind of hidden intermediate concepts, um, so for instance, does a use of armor conduct electricity, you know, the concept of metal is very important there, although it's not mentioned in the question. Are there layers within the transformer where there's something that seems to align with metal or some uh, auxiliary task uh, that shows that presence uh, is there? Yeah, that's a really good good question. Would help. Let's see, Eric. Oh. So just a, a quick comment. I, I know that um, this might be personal uh, for your team. But I know that after 100 years or so of working on this problem, you're all ready to declare success and moving on to other things. That, that's true, right? Uh, or that, that the way, that's where you were last a few months ago. Right. Um, we, I would say we're declaring a milestone and moving, uh, moving on to the next stage. Okay, next stage good. Because the questions you're raising are fabulous and yeah. it might be so, uh, so critical that I hope, I hope your team will be, invest will be investigating these problems or at least making sure someone can use on No, absolutely. Yeah, no, no, we're not sort of, you know, uh, you know, putting Aristo in a box and moving on to, uh, you know, uh, 
sentiment analysis or something like that. No, um, still these questions are, are, are at the core of it. I would, I would say, um, you know, programmatically, we're moving away from a rigid benchmark. Uh, we want to broaden beyond just science to look at other data sets. And we, yeah, we absolutely want to concentrate on some of these harder questions. And, uh, you know, in, in all honesty, um, uh, I'd love to have a data set where these really hard questions are, you know, 100%, but actually they come up in maybe the last 20% of the exam. And, you know, the language models have managed to coax their way through half of them. Um, uh, so I feel like, you know, sort of unlocking ourselves in this particular benchmark will free us to focus on these things more, uh, more directly. Matt? access to the system as they were writing the exam, that they could come up with questions that it would fail on? Uh, um, yes, they would be able to. Um, um, I mean, it depends whether that would help them test students. I guess there's this dichotomy of, you know, students and, uh, uh, and machines. Uh, I do know modern exams are written with, um, so there is some, uh, humans have some latent bias towards, you know, word associations and, and so on. And so uh, I know modern exams are written where they do look at word correlation frequencies and they try to pick answer options, which all seem well correlated with a question to avoid humans doing the kind of cheap tricks uh, guessing that uh, machines do. So, yes, this might be a way of even making systems even making exams even more robust to those kind of tricks for for humans yeah yeah um, so kind of related perhaps but in your failure cases towards the end there are a number that i suspect also human students are probably not doing too well right. on do you have the data on which questions are more discriminative of the performing students that's a really good question. Um, I used to get this data when I was at the, teaching at the UW, and could say that these questions were the ones that selected out the best students. Yeah. And uh, um, those are presumably the ones that are also the hardest and, uh, um, and, and might offer the most challenges for you. I, I, would, I, would ex I would expect there to be a good correlation. It's not necessarily the case, though, that... Um, there's always a correlation. So, so sometimes some of the obscure terminology questions, for instance, can, dis um, can, be, um, can, can distinguish good from bad students, whereas terminology, uh, Aristo finds that very easy. I think that's a really great suggestion. We, we don't have that data. Um, we could look into getting it. So um, that would be very interesting. Yeah. So um, what makes you say that you want language-like representations for reasoning? Um, I think from you know spending years battling with uh, uh, deductive logic systems, uh, <coughs> they um, empirically have been um, hard to build and hard to maintain. And um, in reality, when you see the kind of reasoning that goes on, it's very rarely kind of precise deductive reasoning. So my feeling is that most of human reasoning is of a sort of softer nature. And even, you know, uh, when I showed that chain about, you know, uh, metals conduct electricity and a suit of armor is made of metal, even, even when I look at the actual sentences there, they don't quite align perfectly, but we read them and realize there's a chain. So that kind of softer reasoning, I think, is what we want for our machines as well. Um, uh, I totally agree, but language-like is the way of trying to get that softness by question. Ah, I see. So what would the alternative be then, to map it to some sort of semi-structured representation? Or? Well, we could have distributed representations as in the uh, internals of but right. with structures imposed on those representations. Right. Um, I'm not sure that there's a lot of evidence in, psych in psychology that human reasoning is language-like. Um, right. And of course, there are lots of soft logic formalisms too, That's true. which 
may solve some of the problems, if not all. Yeah. I say this with, with caution. I'm, I'm actually not sure. I mean, at some point, there has to be some sort of merging of kind of some kind of systematic reasoning, sort of step by step process that AI has studied in the past with the kind of new kind of throw everything at Bert's approach. Um, and it may well be that some sort of structure is needed uh, within that. So I think that's one of the big questions for the, the whole field in the next uh, uh, two or three years. Yeah. Uh, so when you removed that question and only fed the answer, the uh -huh. performance dropped on the 12th grade from 90 to 50, which is very reassuring. Right. But at the same time, 50 is a lot better than 25. Right. Is question, where is that coming from? Uh, so I, I, I don't quite know why the number was slightly higher there for the 12th grade. Um, uh, so there might be some artifact in there. I don't, I'm not sure what it is. You know, maybe the correct answer is always slightly longer than the other answers or uh, there's some terminology. Um, so uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Awesome. Thanks for all the